the system is not available, I cannot apply for my credit card. So these are the three critical cybersecurity principles. All right. Yep. So, okay. So let me move forward. So let's have our, our first poll in the afternoon. So we would like to make this an interactive section. We would like your participation. So the first poll that we have down here is, which of the following cybersecurity principle is the most important? All right. Yep. So feel free to input. Yep. So is it confidentiality, integrity, availability, or depends on your business operation? All right. Yep. So let's give a few seconds for uh, our participant to input their opinion. There's no right, there's no wrong. All right, so just input. This is a just interactive discussion section. Don't, yeah. So no one is, I think, faulted or, I mean, uh, giving the wrong answer or anything like that. All right. Okay, I think I have most of the input. All right. So in this case, I will share the result is uh, so we have 40% of the participants who say that confidentiality is most important. And the next closest to answer is uh, 38%, which say that I think depends on your business operation. And next followed by 19%, which say that I think integrity is important. So only 2% say availability is important, all right? Okay, so let me share my answer. All right, let me share my answer. Okay, give me one minute. Yep, the answer is depend on your business operation. So obviously a lot of people will have this question, why, why is this so, all right? So very simple, I mean, this different business operation have different priorities, all right? So take example, if you are an e-commerce business, if you are Lazada, you are Guten, you are this, I think, Alibaba or something like that, I mean that you're an e-commerce operation. So your revenue, came from customer assessing your web page to place order, all right, yeah. So in this kind of, I mean, uh, business operation, so availability is most important for e-commerce operation, e-commerce uh, operator, yeah. Because if their web page is down, then there is, I mean, that you, you customer can't put in their order, so there's no revenue coming in. Of course, the other, uh, Cybersecurity principle like confidentiality, protect customer information, integrity. If they place for place order for one product, then it must be one, one order is not two order. All these are important. But the most critical for an e-commerce operator must be availability. Because if your availability is not in place, customer cannot access and place order, there's no revenue for you. All right. You can protect customer data very secure. You can make sure that every piece of customer data is accurate, but then you cannot sustain your business operation because there's no order, all right? Yeah. So different, on the diff contrary, if you are, uh, I mean, if you are in the defense industry, you're going to de develop certain uh, area monitoring, unmanned aircraft or anything like that. I mean, then confidentiality is utmost important to you, all right? Yeah, just all these are very sensitive defense information. And you, if you share with anybody, then I mean, your business is no longer viable anymore because you spend thousands, millions of dollars developing all this unmanned area monitoring technology, all right? Yeah, so if you're in the defense industry, so confidentiality is utmost important to you, all right? So the answer as such is depend on your business operation. So you need to understand what is your business operation. So when you have a thought and you have the understanding of your business operation, then you can understand that out of these critical cybersecurity principles, which one of them is most important to you and your organization? So how should you prioritize your security control and protect your organization accordingly, all right? So every one of us have limited resource, yeah. We, we, we cannot protect everything, yeah, but we must protect something that is utmost important to us. So, all right, so allow me to move forward. So let's discuss about some of the cybersecurity incident, real life cybersecurity incident that affected us based on these three cybersecurity principles. So first we talk about confidentiality. Right. So for 
confidentiality in February 2019, then we came across this uh, 2,400 Singaporean uh, med medical record HIV data leakage was contacted by MON. Yeah. So the background is that the head of department of uh, HIV department, I mean, controlling all these uh, HIV patient data, copy the data of the patient data out and share with uh, his boyfriend. And obviously his boyfriend, I mean, share this data uh, leaked through public internet, all right? So these are a leak of this, I think, confidentiality. Yeah, so it should not be accessed by uh, unauthorized party, all right? So in this case, yeah, the data was leaked by MON and accessed by unauthorized party. And the next uh, cybersecurity incident that affect integrity, uh, very common, uh, until today is very common, yeah. So in April 2019, I think Singapore police received more than, I think, 90 reports of scam involving takeover of WhatsApp account, which means that your WhatsApp account was being hacked, all right? So in a situation like this, then you came across your friend sending out very funny or abnormal message using their WhatsApp account, some hit, hit, hit message on the WhatsApp group, or they will send... Uh, some funny message asking you to transfer money to them. They say they are in critical stage, they need some help or something like that. Yeah. So these are a situation where your WhatsApp account was being compromised and then the integrity of the account and data associated to the account is no longer accurate and trustworthy. Yeah. Because somebody take over your account and uh, take over your identity and send all these, I think, hate message, send all these, I think, uh, transfer money, help request to your friends, all right? So that is an example of a cybersecurity incident impacted uh, integrity. And in fact, I mean, uh, this WhatsApp account hack is still very prominent today. I think it's not going to stop, yeah. So the next cybersecurity incident that impact availability, is, uh, something that is very uh, closely related to every one of us, where M1, so fiber broadband was down for 33 hours yeah, during the circuit breaker period, May 2020. All right. So M1 said that this, I think it was due to this uh, network boostering initiative. Yeah. So in fact, I think during then I was attending a class with my professor in NUS and our uh, evening class had to be canceled because our professor can't access uh, this uh, M1 internet from his home or yeah. So before, during then, every one of us will from home. All right. So these are real life cybersecurity incident that related to the cybersecurity principle that we highlighted earlier on. So moving forward, let me share with you the cybersecurity paradigm. All right. So how does all these, I mean, threat attack happen to us? All right. So first thing first, so there is a threat. All right. So a threat is defined as an activity that may adversely impact the cybersecurity of a computer system. So when this threat exploit a vulnerability, so a vulnerability uh, it was defined as a weakness in the computer system, all right? So there must be a weakness in the computer system and then this, tr this threat exploit the vulnerability and then it will result in something we call a risk, all right? So risk is the potential loss or damage to a computer system, yeah. So what, as cybersecurity professional down here, then what we are trying to do is that we have to mitigate the risk, which means we reduce the risk to an acceptable level. So how do we reduce the risk or mitigate the risk to an acceptable level? We apply security control. The security control meaning safeguard to minimize security risk to a computer system. So it go in a cycle. All right, so these are the cybersecurity paradigm that uh, we encounter in cybersecurity. So moving back to our example, all right. So what are the security control uh, that we can put in place to reduce uh, the risk for confidentiality for this uh, cybersecurity incident uh, for this uh, MOH, uh, HIV data leak, all right. So there are many controls that we can put in place. Yeah. 
But one of the uh, formidable control is that we can put in encryption, encrypt HIV uh, patient data, all right? So which means that you can copy the data out, yeah, but without the encryption key or the decryption key, then you cannot see the data, all right? So it will be the garbage, rubbish, all right? Make no sense to anyone, all right? So if MOM, MOH have put in this control during then, so when the data was leaked, then the, the damage uh, will not be there because I mean, nobody can read your data. Uh, so next, what are the, what is the security control that can put in place for integrity? All right. So WhatsApp, yeah. So your WhatsApp hack is being taken place. So obviously one of the most uh, standard item that we can put in place is two-factor authentication. Yeah. So that when this, I think, uh, when an attacker try to send you a verification code, then uh, you check with this, I think you input a two-factor authentication. Uh, you set up your WhatsApp account using two-factor authentication. So anything, something like this happen, then you won't be a target uh, for the attacker when they send you the verification code, all right? So other than that, availability, what's the security control that we can put in place? Well, I think, uh, high availability cluster, meaning uh, duplicator setup, or you have a duplicator system as an alternate site. All right. So obviously, I mean, uh, M1 put in uh, this, I think, uh, high availability, uh, so in place, but it doesn't work. All right. Yeah. So uh, it, it doesn't mean that, I mean, M1 don't have a backup. M1 don't have a redundancy. They do. Yeah. It's just that in a situation happened to their incident, the security control failed to work, all right? They have backup, but the backup didn't kick in to solve the problem, all right? So that is particularly the security control that we can put in place to mitigate the security issues that we came across. So moving forward, let me do a recap of this uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak, all right? So during COVID-19 outbreak, so government, business, is very busy, I think, providing incentive to employee to advise them how we can work from home. Yeah. But then on the opposite side, yeah, the cyber criminal are also very busy in attacking, uh, attacking the organization and you and me, uh, because there's a larger attacking surface now that we work from home. All right. And a weaker security setup because that, I mean, that your setup in the home might not be as secure as your office yeah so what is happening during then yeah so let's come to our second poll yeah so do the cyber security increase during COVID-19 outbreak yeah so this is a very uh, simple question yeah so uh, let's have a poll and then after that I think we will see what is your input all right So is it yes, is it no, or you're not very sure about that? Yeah, yeah. So COVID uh, pandemic hit uh, every one of us on, every one of us, I mean, based on World Health Organization, you're not, uh, you're not spared because you are rich or you're poor, or which nation you're from, they affect everyone. So we are affected as security, cyber security professional, we are affected. Cyber criminals are also affected. The attacker are also affected. It affect every one of us. Yeah. So what happened during this period? All right. So okay. All right. We have a full result out. Yeah. So eighty-two percent of the attendees say that well, I mean, cyber security attack increased during this period. Yeah. One percent said no, it, it, uh, it does not increase, and another uh, seventeen percent said not sure. So let's have a quick look and answer. So what is the answer? Oops, give me one minute. Yeah. The answer is yes. Obviously, it increased during COVID-19 period. Yeah. Okay. So let me share this data uh, extracted from this uh, Singapore police and Interpol. All right. Yeah. So in from in Singapore. All right. So in 2019, I mean the cyber crime. Uh, jump by more than 50%. And in the first half of 2020, which is the period where 
this COVID-19 hit us. Yeah. So banking related phishing scam uh, spiked more than 2,500%. Uh, 2,500%, that's a lot. Yeah. And in total, there's 82 million cheated in scam. All right. So obviously that, I mean, when you look on the press, there are scam that is selling face masks, there's scam that is selling sanitizer. Yeah. And I think not only selling face masks in terms of something like uh, one, two boxes, three, four boxes, there are situations where they are selling cartons, uh, even container of face masks uh, resulted in uh, over hundred thousand of dollars lost in Singapore. All right. So for this, I think globally, based on the data published by Interpol, yeah, then uh, Interpol highlighted that I think uh, during this period, uh, COVID-19 team phishing email, I mean, escalated. Yeah. So cyber criminal entice victim to provide their personal information and download uh, malicious content. Yeah. And another item is that during this period, ransomware attack at critical infrastructure and healthcare institution. All right. So obviously, I mean, uh, healthcare institution, I mean, is prominent uh, frontline uh, to deal with, I mean, all these uh, pandemic outbreak. So the cyber attacker are trying to attack them uh, to extract all the, I mean, any monetary advantage or blackmail them or try to steal some critical information from them. So understand that, I mean, these are the top two uh, cyber crime. Yeah. So phishing and ransomware. Same thing in Singapore, phishing uh, is the number four uh, high rated uh, cyber crime. And let's have a look at them in more details. All right. So what is phishing? All right. So phishing meaning that an attacker masquerading as a trusted entity. All right, so maybe government, maybe healthcare authority trick the victim to open a malware, infected email, instant message or text message. All right, so this malware then steal sensitive personal information, banking or credit card details, password, credential, anything like that. All right, so that, that is the basic about phishing. All right, so how do we protect ourselves and our organization from phishing? So some of the quick tips down here is never release your personal information. All right, very common. I mean that you'll come across this message uh, sent on behalf of DBS to say, oh, your account will be locked uh, if you not provide your personal information message in the next hour or a message from Singapore police to say, okay, uh, you are being investigated. Please fill in all this detail. So never, never release your personal information. Yeah. And do not open a link or attachment in an email, in an instant message, or from an unknown user. All right. So that, that is something that is, I think, prominent. Don't open something that you do not know who sent this thing to you. All right. Yeah. But of course, I mean that all these attacks have matured. All right. So now we have something called uh, this uh, credential theft. All right. So somebody can steal the email credential of your supervisor or your boss. All right. And then send an email using your boss uh, email ID. And theoretically, you look at this email coming from your boss and you say, oh, well, my boss sent me an email. Of course, I open it, all right? Uh, but that is beside the topic. We can discuss it uh, separately. We don't have sufficient time to talk about it in this section, yeah. So next tip is, I think, prevent uh, opening any them website and obviously apply the latest security patch and AV signature. So obviously, I think that uh, a lot of us, when we come across this system patch message coming to our laptop or PC, and then uh, we try to say, okay, postpone it, postpone it. I have more important work to do. But take note that every time you postpone all this critical security patch applying on your system, then you are adding additional risk to you, all right? So try not to do that because, I mean, you're subjected to more and more risk if you don't apply the latest security patches, all right? So of course, Next, you can attend a security awareness training yeah, and to identify phishing attack and report phishing uh, to your IT security department so that they know what are the attack coming to your organization and they can tackle it from organization-wide level. 
So moving forward, second highest uh, threat is, is uh, ransomware. So what is ransomware? Ransomware is an attacker encrypt data on your computer system. Uh, so through a malware that installed through deception link in email, instant message or website, it then display a message to threaten to release your data to the public or permanently delete them unless you pay a fee to acquire a key to decrypt your data. All right. So what are the quick tips we can use to counter ransomware? Of course, first and foremost, back up your data regularly and ensure that the data that you back up can be restored when you need them. Yeah. So a lot of time you back up the data, but you never verify that uh, are they in the integrity is in place, can they be restored? All right. So when you need to restore data, you take a backup copy, restore it. Well, it doesn't work. <laughs> All right, so that are the critical problem in this, I think, backup operation. You know, not only we need to backup, but you need to verify that your backup copy is working. And of course, similarly, you must apply the latest security patch and AV signature. And you should not open a link or attachment from unknown user. Uh, so next, attend a uh, ransomware awareness training to identify ransomware attack. And last but not least, uh, report to your IT department so that they can, I mean, look at this attack and resolve it from organization wide level. Okay, so moving forward is, I think, let me share some impact of ransomware uh, on the nature of ransomware. Yeah. So for individual, ransomware value normally not very high. Lah. I mean, if the ransomware is target at individual, so theoretically, it's 300 to 500 US dollar, and the uh, attacker will ask you to pay via Bitcoin or Moreno or any cryptocurrency that you cannot trace them, all right? So they, they don't ask for an amount that's too high because they know that if you target an individual consumer, if it's too high, then I mean the individual might not pay, all right? But then I mean that a standard is nature of fact is that even if you pay the ransom, 300, 500 uh, US dollars, not very high, to you, yeah, then you realize that I think you might not get your decryption key back, all right? So you might not get your data, you might not get the decryption key because I mean that it depends on how, how I mean, uh, credible the attacker is, all right? Yeah, so there are some credible uh, cyber attacker or cyber criminal, they'll release the uh, decryption key or data to you, all right, when you pay the ransom, yeah? But obviously there are those that even you pay the money, you pay the ransom, they won't give you back your data. Or they won't give you back the decryption key. All right. Yeah. So then for corporate level, then the impact is much wider. I mean, the ransom value will be high. All right. So what is at stake when your company is being attacked by ransomware? So your company reputation will be affected. Customer confidence in your operation will be affected. Sensitive personal data might be stolen. Client data might be stolen. Your revenue will be affected. Yeah. So what? Let me just share a quick example with you. All right. Yeah. So on 3rd October, last Saturday, yeah, Software AG, the second largest software provider in Germany, was being attacked. Yeah. So they are being attacked by a ransomware. And the ransomware uh, group ask for this, I think the cyber criminal asked for 20 million uh, from this uh, software AG, all right? So this amount is very high. I think one of the highest, I think we see in the, this uh, cyber security arena. So 20 million is very high, yeah? So think about it. If you are the customer of software AG, all right? So you use software AG, cloud services software for business process mapping, for enterprise resource management, then do you have confidence in them? All right, who are their customer? All right, so these are household names. I mean, Airbus, Fujitsu, DHL, Vodafone. Yeah, if I'm software AG customer, if you're hit by a ransomware and then my data is being stolen there, then of course, I think first thing first, I think I will consider twice about subscribing your service. Uh, next time, all right. Yeah. Okay, so next, uh, let, let's go to the last poll of today. Uh, let's share about, I think, who is responsible for cybersecurity? Yeah. 
So is it Chief Information Security Officer? Is it Chief Information Officer? Or is it Chief Information Security Officer? Or everyone in the organization? Uh, so there's no right, no wrong. I mean, we are in a casual uh, this, uh, discussion section. All right? So input your thoughts, perspective, so that I think we can have a view uh, how does the participation, how the participants uh, felt about this topic. Who do you think should uh, be responsible? Who should be answerable? Yeah. Okay, so the poll result is out. So 83% say everyone in the organization. Uh, so 10% say chief information security officer and only 1% say uh, chief executive officer. All right, so uh, nobody say chief information uh, officer is responsible for it. Yep. So, okay, very good. So, uh, let me share my answer. So the answer is correct. Everywhere, most of you get it correct. Everyone in the organization, everyone in the organization is responsible for cybersecurity. So the next question is why? All right, why? Yeah. So down here, I think this information was extracted from this uh, EY Global Information Security Survey. Yeah. So it said that. 32% of security breaches are resulted by employees, all right? So more about 20%, yeah. So it's inside the employee weakness, which means that you are ignorant, you accidentally configure something incorrectly, all right? Yeah, misconfiguration, yeah. So that is, I think, uh, unintentional, unintentional, all right? Yeah, I think moving forward, you have, I think, close to 12% or 13%, yeah, to say that, well, I mean, 12%, sorry, yeah, 12% to say that, well, I mean, uh, the attack uh, security breaches was resulted by malicious attack by uh, insiders, which means that disgruntled employees, yeah, they are not very happy, uh, so they created all these security breach, they steal your data, or they, I mean, uh, create a, is a vulnerability in your network system so that some people can attack them, all right? So 32% uh, of security breaches are resulted by internal employees so that everyone in the organization is in charge of security, all right? Yeah, so if you figure out that something is not correct or you figure out that some uh, malicious action is taking place, even if it's not your responsibility, you report to the IT security department, all right? So it's not only management are accountable, management like uh, chief information security, chief uh, executive officer, CEO, CIO, they are all obviously, they have part and parcel of the responsibility, but it should not be, the sole responsibility is not lie with them and them only, which means that everyone in the organization have a part to play in cybersecurity so that together we make the organization a safer cyber environment. All right, so with this done, I think uh, let me quickly share with some of the trainings that I think uh, uh, NUS ISS are offered down here. All right, so uh, NUS ISS is a uh, official partner and the only official partner in Singapore offering this IC Squared training. So if you're not familiar with IC Squared, then I mean, you should be very familiar with the uh, training or certification offered by them. I think like CISSP, CCSP, uh, CSSLP, or SSCP, all right. So CISSP, I mean, is the most wanted uh, security certification by employees uh, in Singapore based on the LinkedIn uh, job search portal uh, by Singapore Job last year, 2019. There are 20,000 jobs that uh, stated that CISSP uh, security credential is preferred, all right? So as compared to the next, I mean, security credential is uh, something like CISM is only 7,000, all right? So these are the most uh, prominent security certification required by employees in Singapore, yeah. So other than that, we also have other training, uh, IC, we have other uh, training related to risk. Uh, so we have risk awareness, uh, so manage cyber risk, yeah, architecture, then we have uh, mobile, secure mobile architecture or developing cybersecurity architecture. And we have uh, uh, other software, AI 
uh, training and other training, including uh, cybersecurity for ICT professional, securing IoT, yep, and platform security, all this suite of training. Feel free to look at our this uh, QR code. Uh, and then after that, I think uh, visit our webpage. Uh, there will be more details down there. Yep. Okay. So other than that, uh, so NUSISS not only offer about executive training, yeah, we also offer about a uh, graduate program. We offer this uh, graduate diploma and master of technology. So if you're interested, feel free to look at our webpage and there's more detail down there. Yeah. All right. And next, I think uh, let's have more time for our Q&A section. Yeah to come up to figure out uh, is there any question or any burning question you have about cybersecurity which I can help to address. Yeah. So uh, just check with Amber. Amber, any yeah. uh, question from the this uh, group that I think have some question that I think we, we can sure. discuss and share yeah. with the group. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neil, for the insightful um, sharing. So there are a few questions. So uh, please do keep the questions coming. We have um, ample time for Q&A. So maybe the first question that I can um, just pick out is actually about from, uh, from Hua Chen, uh, for Hua Chen. Just wondering if trainer can elaborate more about advanced security measures that we can do on our own besides the uh, using difficult, um, pass, uh, difficult password. Is it, going, is it safe to go incognito mode? If not, then what are the other options to, to avoid peeping toms? Uh, I'm not too sure is the question related to, I mean, uh, password security or uh, safeguarding the credential. Yeah. So uh, if we are talking about protecting our credential, so basically I think it's very simple. I mean, that the base, most basic is talking about uh, username and password. All right. So obviously we understand that, I mean, in the current landscape, Username and password is no longer uh, sufficient. Yeah, and then I think the the most common security uh, elevation that we go after is two-factor or multi-factor authentication. All right. Yeah. So then, obviously, I think during the uh, during the emerging uh, technology, then I think uh, we have this SMS. Uh, so now we also realize that SMS is no longer secure because of this SS7 attack on the telco network. Yeah, so uh, a lot of company are phasing out this uh, SMS, no longer using SMS, yeah. So as you are aware, if you are using digital banking on in Singapore, I think we are no longer using SMS anymore. So we proceed on to using a secure token, all right. Uh, so one-time password, secure token, yeah. So there's a, I mean, more elevated approach that we can safeguard our, this, I think, uh, safeguard our, this, I think, uh, Credential, all right. So if your question is related to credential, then uh, I would say that I think these are the additional measure that you can put in place. Yeah, of course, you also can, I think, to other than, I mean, taking other than, I mean, uh, reducing the exposure of the credential, then you might want to input all those, I mean, uh, endpoint security uh, monitoring feature to make sure that if there's any abnormal activity from your endpoint user, transmitting a lot of data or copy a lot of data out from your network, then that, that is something that you can monitor to make sure that I think secure the data uh, and secure the environment for your company. Thank you. So uh, another question that was uh, received that is, uh, is it possible that security patch can be sent by Fisher tool? If, if so, how do we recognize that? Uh, security patch can be sent by what again? The, uh, the fishes uh, is in those people that send out the phishing emails. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So security patch, I think it, it, it obviously it can send by uh, this uh, phishing email to say, okay, these are the security patch that you need to apply immediately. Yeah. If you don't apply immediately, then I mean that uh, your vulnerability to this list of attack is common, nothing special. Yeah. So obviously as an end user, then... Uh, you have to identify, I mean, that this, uh, this email or this message sent to you, are they a taunting message or are they not a taunting message? All right. So obviously, I mean, that for a simplistic point of view is that if you look at the email header, then you figure out that, well, I mean, that though who sent this email to you? All right. 
So if somebody wants you to patch your machine, then theoretically, uh, if it's company asset, then I mean, uh, it should be from your IT department. All right. So if you receive an email or any message that is not from your IT department asking you to patch your machine, then you have concern. All right. Yeah. Should I patch the machine or not? Most probably not because they don't came from authentic source. All right. So a standard IT operation aspect is that as a IT operation, as IT operator, all right. So I want to download a security patch from Win from uh, Microsoft Windows. Yeah. So obviously I have to download it from Microsoft, which is a authentic site. I don't download the patch from any other third party, which I don't trust. All right. And when I download the patches from Microsoft, I will check the uh, signature to make sure that this security patch that I'm applying actually came from Microsoft. So the, 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 same, uh, cons, the same practice applied. So when you are going to apply a security patch, then you must make sure that I mean, it came from your IT department, those authorized asking you to patch. All right. If it don't come from them, then most probably you're not going to patch. Yeah. And if you're not using a corporate machine, maybe for a home laptop, PC or anything like that, then you want to make sure that you're pulling the security patches from Microsoft. All right. So if somebody send you an email to say, please patch your machine, else not you're vulnerable to this list of attack, I would say most probably not. Lah. I mean, uh, they, they are, unless you subscribe to a mailing list from a security forum or something, something like that, uh, unlikely there'll be anyone who, who send this kind of email to you asking you to patch your machine. Most probably these emails are malicious. And you know that if it's malicious email, please don't open them, don't read them. Uh, you can delete them. All right, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. So the next question that we had, how do we trace the hacker or phishing scams to find out where they are based or the location of the servers that they are using, such as their IP? Oh, okay. Yeah. So that is a form of investigation, cyber investigation forensic. All right. So normally, I mean that uh, we can we can look at the this, I think, the mail, the exchange server or the mailer, mail server, which I mean, in an email operation, all right, in an email operation, very simple, you send your email to a server, which is the SMTP server. So the SMTP will send this email to the next party, to the next party, to the next party, uh, to the next SMTP server, all right, until it reach your SMTP server. And then after that, or uh, mailbox, then after that, you will deposit the email in your mailbox. So obviously, if you say, okay, I want to see, uh, who sent this phishing email to me? Uh, well, well, very simple. You can always look at your mail header and trace back the SMTP server uh, along the way. Yeah, that is, I mean, uh, who the, then after that, you figure out who, who is the first SMTP server and uh, under what domain, uh, who is the user that sent you this uh, email, all right? So you can trace back, yeah. But I mean that uh, tracing back might not be able to allow you to identify who is sending you this phishing email, all right? Yeah, because I mean that a lot of time, I think cyber criminal, they are sending this email yeah, or sending a lot of information yeah, through compromised machine. I think we call them books, B-O-T-S, books, all right? So the simple thing is that I think uh, in this, I think uh, denial of service attack, yeah, so denial of service attack or distributed denial of service attack that attack uh, your network or even they attack this, I think, uh, South Korean banking system a few years back. Yeah, so this came from compromised machine, all right? Which means that the attacker have compromised all these machine, thousands of them, yeah, uh, beforehand, yeah. But I mean that uh, they just activate at a particular time to send out lots of traffic to you to down your network. Yeah, you, and in a situation like this, I mean, all this uh, source or all this machine IP address or whatever thing you can trace back, I mean, they can easily come from those compromised machine, all right? So you can find the identity who sent you that, but I mean, are they the actual cyber criminal behind? Maybe not, and most probably not, because uh, the cyber criminal will try their best to hide their threat. They, they won't allow you to trace them simply so simply, all right. So using this simply step that we trace, we can figure out who is the source that sent you this machine, all right. And the source keep changing, right? Yeah. So you can say, well, this is the source. 
So I block it. Uh, tomorrow, another source. Oh, no, no need tomorrow. Another two, three hours, your source will change. Another two, three hours, the source will change. So if you are trying to say, I block one by one, uh, then I mean that your cyber defense strategy is uh, ad hoc. Uh, so it is not effective because you have to add a rule or something to block your traffic every two, three hours. All right. So in short, uh, we can trace back who is the one who sent you the phishing email. Yeah, but are they the actual party or are they the actual cyber criminal? Most in most cases, they are not. Lah. Yeah. Thank you. So the next question will be uh, asking about which um, type of biometrics authentication method is the most secure? Is it iris scanning, facial recognition, or fingerprint? Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, so biometric. You're right, biometric, I mean that we normally came across, I think, in commercial usage, all right, yeah. So the most uh, most uh, common usage is door access. Uh, so uh, cut access or whatever, Bi uh, no, sorry, cut is not biometric, all right. So biometric, I think the most common access, I think uh, I understand is based on I think data center, all right. So the most common use is, I think, fingerprint, all right. So when you go inside your data center, most probably you need to use fingerprint to access certain uh, certain doors or certain part of your data center. All right. So you, you never use biometric as a single source of access. Like it's always a combination of what you have or what you know. All right. Yeah. So normally you have cut access followed by biometric. Yeah. So, but biometric is getting more and more common. I think thank, thanks to the high adaptation of this uh, mobile phone. Yeah. So right now you can use uh, your this face recognition, can use your thumbprint to unlock your phone or something like that. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, which biometric aspect is more secure? Yeah. So a very simply fact of comparing, I think we don't go into details. So we can say that, well, I mean, the fingerprint is not as secure as this uh, retina scan and retina scan is not as secure as iris scan. All right, yeah. We also have the fluctuation, all right. Yeah, fluctuation, yeah. So uh, as technology emerge, I think there's less and less uh, false positive. Yeah, so obviously during those days that I think uh, when this iPhone or any of the mobile phone release face recognition to unlock your phone. Uh, you saw some of these, I think, interesting uh, this release blog on the internet to say that, well, I mean, uh, uh, some people, I think, uh, uh, look similar or something, something like that. I think they can unlock uh, somebody's phone. Yeah. So uh, face recognition, I think, is uh, accurate most of the time, but uh, some gap or some distance uh, to be fully effectiveness. Uh, so obviously, I mean that it is just a balance between false uh, positive and false negative that you have. So to, to have this, I think, correctness, correctness to a certain percentage for this uh, biometric authentication. Yeah. So in short, I think retina is more uh, secure than uh, the other kind of, I think, biometric because it, it measure our this eyeball veins or something, something like that. All right. Yeah. So I hope I answer your question. I mean, if you're interested, we can go in more detailed discussion after our section because this is biometric. I think authentication is a a, 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 a topic that we can discuss for many, many hours. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, there is a question about the um, career prospect in um, cybersecurity. Is it considered an infocom prof uh, profession? And what's the prospect of the uh, cybersecurity careers in Singapore in the next five to 10 years and what are the certifications needed? So uh, there's a very long question, like any uh, range or limitation in terms of career switcher? Uh, okay, yeah. So I, obviously this is, is something, uh, this is something that I think we can discuss in detail. Yeah. So I, I don't think I can provide a very comprehensive answer down here. Yeah. Singapore, I mean, it is progressed into a smart nation, all right? So Singapore want to be a smart nation. It is uh, our nation initiative driven by the prime minister office, all right? So that's why we are all out here attending this section. Yeah, 
And the one of the most prominent part of a uh, smart nation is cybersecurity. So our prime minister uh, said that we must get cybersecurity correct so that we can drive our smart nation. So Korea perspective about cybersecurity is obviously uh, positive. Yeah. So every one of us understand that we, we are under this, I think, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic outbreak at this point of time. Yeah. But something that I learned from my friends who are this, I think, in this uh, recruitment firm, yeah, headhunters. Yeah. So they are saying that I think, well, I mean, they, they are still, I think, a lot of uh, company looking for cybersecurity professional at this point of time. All right. Yeah. So they are... There are less, all right? There, are, there, are, there. Are, I think uh, something like some company, yeah, will choose to hire staff on uh, contract basis, yeah. But they did not stop hiring at this point of time, which means that, uh, as what we cover in our section earlier on, cyber security attack go up during this period. So obviously they need more people to counter cyber security attack at this point of time. So they, 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 is it something to say that, uh, well, I mean, uh, because business go down, then uh, I will delay any recruitment for cyber security professional. Yeah. So theoretically that's what happened in business, right? I mean, business slow down, slow down higher. Yeah. But now I mean that that is, uh, that is a factor that is changing, which means that business slow down, but cyber security attack go up. Yeah. So cyber security attack go up, then it will be a business decision to say that, well, in the situation like this, then how should I deal with all this cyber attack coming in? Should I push back my hiring? So that I mean, uh, I, 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 my, my cyber security professional come in later, or should I get the cybersecurity person coming in uh, to tackle the increase in cyber attack at this point of time. All right. So no right, no wrong. Yeah. Obviously, some organization will push back uh, hiring for cybersecurity professional. Uh, but based on uh, what they shared with me on the recruitment firm side is that uh, there are a majority of firms that still prefer to hire at this point of time because they make their risk assessment, all right? So if the risk is high, attack keep coming in, then I need somebody to help me to counter all this attack, yeah? So if you look at other position, all right, other position, maybe uh, sales, all right, do, do, I, do I need uh, more sales at this point of time? Yes, maybe, yeah. My business slow down, I need more sales, yeah. So I should get more sales in, yeah. But maybe that business slow down, I hire more sales, also no point, right? Yeah. So, the, the, the people, uh, I mean, my customer is not in the mood of purchasing. I get more sales in, no point. So I can push back hiring for other positions, uh, sales, HR, procurement, whatever thing, all right, yeah. But security is an area that they need to make strategic consideration that should they continue to hire. And as far as I know, at this point of time, company is still hiring uh, security professional, yeah. So you go to this uh, LinkedIn job portal, you can see a lot of job uh, for this uh, security down there. Yeah, correct. So the question down here is that, what kind of cyber security jobs you are looking for? Yeah, and uh, what kind of job or what kind of skill set you have to fulfill this job? All right, yeah. So it is not that, I mean, cyber security is, is not, I think, uh, one aspect, all right? So in cybersecurity, we have operation, we have forensic investigation, we have threat hunting, we have risk and compliance, uh, we have this uh, project planning. So there, there's many areas in cybersecurity. So it, 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 it doesn't matter, it, it don't work in a way to say that, well, I am a cybersecurity trade, I can go into any job that you have, yeah. So you need to have a correct fit to go into the correct job, yeah. So uh, last, I think, lastly, I think just let me cover on all these, I mean, uh, the cyber uh, security training and credential. So obviously, I mean that, uh, please come to uh, our training. I would like to share more with you, yeah. So the question is that, I think, 
which area you intend to proceed in your cybersecurity career, all right? Yeah, so obviously, I mean that if you say that, okay, I want to proceed in engineering, security engineering, then you can take up this uh, SSCP, yeah. And if you say, I want to progress in security compliance management risk, yeah, then you can take up uh, CISSP, all right? So these are the, like what I cover, I think CISSP is the uh, fundamental requirement for most employee in Singapore, all right? Yeah, so if you want to specialize in cloud, uh, so I want to be a cloud specialist, uh, cloud security specialist, then you can go for CCSP, all right? So if you want to be someone who is, I think, uh, focused in risk and compliance, then we have a program managed cybersecurity risk. You can come for this training. So uh, which uh, training you want to attend will depend on, I think, which career track you want to progress in cybersecurity. There are many tracks, right? Some people prefer uh, active hands-on, right? Yeah. So 24 by 7 activity, they are very, I mean, uh, they are very I mean, active, they, they can't stay still, all right? Yeah. So I have friends that is like something like this, they can't stay still, yeah. But some people who are more on a thinking approach, they want to plan, uh, they want to talk about policy, they want to talk about uh, strategy, yeah. So then that is a different group or different career track. So determine which career track you want to be and figure out what training that can help you to progress in the career track you wanted to be. All right, so like what I say, this is something that can go on and on. I, I cannot cover everything in this short section. Yeah, so maybe let me go to the next question. Thank you. The next question will be on the banking digital, uh, sorry, the bank's digital banking. Is it safe that uh, we can rely on the bank security system? Does it mean that I do not have any security software on my device? Uh, is it safe to proceed? Uh, okay. Banking system, I mean, uh, if you're referring to digital banking, yeah. So digital banking, then uh, obviously uh, the banking platform is uh, secure. Yeah, I mean, as far as we are aware, it is uh, secure based on known threat, lah, all right? Known threat, unknown threat, we do not know because I mean, tomorrow there may be a unknown threat coming out and does it affect the banking, uh, digital banking, internet banking, all these things? Uh, maybe? Maybe not, we do not know, all right, yeah. But based on the known track, they are secure because I mean, all the banking or financial institute are regulated by MAS in Singapore. So what do we mean by regulated by MAS? Which means that they need to comply to MAS technology risk management framework, all right. So MAS technology risk management framework is a very robust framework to make sure that your system, your software, your application, is secure for use, all right? It's secure for use. So they have, uh, uh, for example, they have installed the certificate so that, I mean, all the traffic between uh, your machine, your web browser to their uh, web server is encrypted, all right? So if anyone, I mean, intercept this uh, traffic along the way, yeah, then, I mean, uh, the traffic was encrypted. You cannot read them, they are in garbage, all right? So to, Intercept traffic in the internet is very simple. Like, I mean, uh, well, may, may not be that simple, but I mean that if you work in the service provider, it can be very simple, like, correct? Yeah. So if you subscribe to M1 network or you subscribe to Singtel network and I'm a network operator inside the data center, I simply go to the core switch, plug in one cable, key in a port mirroring command and then all the traffic come to me, all right? So of course, with so many hundred terabit of data, I mean, how, how do I find your, uh, the data I wanted, and then that is another set of question. Yeah. So in short, yes, I mean the banking, we can assume or we can safely assume that the banking platform is secure because they are regulated by uh, MAS. They need to comply to MAS technology risk management framework. Yeah. And they are subjected to external penetration testing, risk assessment at least once per year. All right. Yeah. So of course, I mean that. Uh, even if they are regulated by MAS, does it mean that uh, their platform is not secure? I mean, does it mean their platform 100% secure? I mean, may not be. Like, sometimes there are gaps here and there, all right? Yeah. So obviously, when 
a security incident happened and after investigation, MAS figured out that they are uh, they didn't comply to this uh, technology risk management framework. There is a gap. Yeah, then MAS will impose a penalty on them, lah. All right. Yeah. So coming to coming to it is that I mean then I mean the next question is that yes I think we can treat that all these banking platform is secure, but then I mean that you need to take note that I mean uh, when you assessing this banking platform, the most common security attack that we have is that are they the actual website that you are you are assessing. Right. So, for example, I mean, uh, we come across, I think, Singapore police issue an advisory to say, okay, this DBS website, I mean, uh, asking you to access, it's not an authentic one, please do not access them. Yes, everything look exactly exactly like a DBS web page, except that it's not from DBS. All right. Yeah. So, the URL, I mean, might, might, might be something like, uh, the URL might look something different. All right. Instead of dbs.com.se, it might be something like, sg-dbs.com.sg, something like that. I mean that. So you must make sure that you assess the correct banking apps uh, from the DBS, all right? So then the next thing is that, I think if you're assessing the banking apps, you can consider that, that as secure. But does it mean that, I mean, uh, does it mean that, well, I mean, uh, I do not need to have any security uh, at my endpoint, which means my laptop don't need to have antivirus or my laptop don't need to have any uh any security mechanism uh, security patches or anything like that i think that that should not be the case because in the first place you must make sure that your endpoint is secure all right yeah so if the endpoint your machine is not secure i mean you, you have nothing to protect you i mean that is something similar that you have a house all right uh, but your house have no door no locks anyone can come in all right so if anyone can come into your, I mean, uh, endpoint machine, which means your laptop, your PC, or anything like that, your tablet or whatever thing, well, I think then uh, if your machine is being compromised, then there, there's no need to talk about, I mean, uh, uh, assessing the digital banking site, are they secure or not secure? Because you are being breached in the first place already. So what is important is first place is that you must make sure that you are secure, all right? So then the second thing that you must make sure is that I assess the authentic web page website. All right, they are secure. Don't assess those that is uh, massacred or those uh, mimic website that I mean from the attacker. Even they they look uh, similar. So how do we identify they are not the authentic website? Yeah, then that is where you have to go to attend your this uh, phishing uh, training. All right. So through your phishing training, then we will guide you. Uh, how to identify a website is they authentic or is not authentic? Yeah. Okay. So maybe let's have the last question before we end the section. Yep. Okay. So the last question, maybe I can actually choose this question. Yeah. So yeah. Um, is there any um, recommendation of any antivirus or malware firewall to use personally for a home system? Uh, okay. Yeah. So I obviously there, there are a lot of, I think, uh, Antivirus, firewall, pers uh, personal firewall uh, that I think we can use to safeguard our endpoint, which means our laptop, our PC. All right. Yeah. So, uh, the, they, I think what I, what I would recommend is that I think use those that is uh, reputable. All right. Use those that is reputable, which means that they have a reputation in the market. Yeah. They have a reputation in the market. Yeah. So, which means that if you're using this antivirus, uh, personal uh, laptop, uh, firewall or something, something like that. I mean, yeah, or malware detection. Uh, so if you're using from a reputable uh, vendor, then the vendor have a reputation to protect, right? Yeah, which means that if my machine is being uh, compromised using your antivirus, using your anti-malware software, then I mean, it still get compromised. Then I mean, it have a reputation impact on the vendor. So the vendor will try to roll out, I mean, reputable, uh, effective antivirus or this, I think, personal firewall or anti-malware to protect you. All right. So who are the reputable, uh, who are the reputable, I think, uh, vendor? Uh, and of, of course, there's a lot. Lah, right? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, whether you be it Microsoft, be it Symantec, be it Kempesky, uh, be it, I think, uh, is McAfee. I think that there are just a lot of them. I mean that 
Uh, but one point to note is I think theoretically what we recommend, uh, what we recommend user is that uh, use more than one antivirus. <laughs> yeah, or use more than one antivirus. So just in case that one doesn't work, I mean, the threat will be picked up by the other one. All right, yeah. So that is in security we call layer of defense. Yeah, so if one doesn't work, the other one will pick it up. So of course, if you operate on a corporate laptop, yeah, then you have to abide by your corporate policy. Yeah, so the corporate policy is I install, maybe take example, Simon Tech. Can I install another antivirus software on top of it? Maybe not. I mean, that if you do something like this, you might violate your, this, I mean, uh, corporate policy, all right? Because, I mean, your, your corporate IT department will say that, well, you, you install this capacity. I don't even know capacity is secure or not. I mean, this software that you install, is it from a authentic source? Or is, or is, is this capacity antivirus you install is an impacted malware copy, all right? Because you never download it from a authentic source. We can we discuss about it, all right? So you, you might bring in all this uh, threat into your organization if you install on your this uh, corporate laptop. So always check with your IT if you want to uh, install something, does it violate the corporate policy? So uh, other than that, it's always a good practice on your personal laptop. I mean, install more than one antivirus software or more than one anti-malware software that is, I think, uh, from different sources so that if something don't get picked up by this guy, hopefully it can pick up by the other guy. All right, so security, we talk about uh, layer of defense, defense in depth, all right, yeah. So understand that there are a number of questions that we didn't manage to address uh, in this section, but no worry, I think just, I think uh, Amber will forward this question to me and I'll try to address them, I think, uh, uh, separately. I think when you uh, fill in the survey, then uh, we, we can send out the list of Q&A uh, to all of you. I'll try my best to answer those questions that you have. Uh, okay, thank you, Max. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neil. So, um, yep, yes, yep. For, if you have any burning question that you uh, would like um, Dr. Neil to answer, you can email me separately so that I can collate and send it to, to him, then he can actually get back to you guys. Okay, so thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we will be sending out the slides um, together with the survey that we will maybe ask you to help us to fill in so that we can see on the areas that we can improve on. So once again, thanks for joining us. And we hope to see you at the next Smart Nation Together channel program again. Thank you so much and have a good day ahead. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.